Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 478, Fast Tracking Drugs at the FDA. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. So Dr. Moffin, we've talked about the FDA in a number of previous podcasts. We have our issues with them and where, where their politics have seemed to lie. And there's, there's a conflict between what are the politics when considering a medicine uh, or some treatment process Mm -hmm. for approval with the stamp of approval by the Food and Drug Administration, the federal regulatory agency. What's the difference between the science and the politics Mm -hmm. and possibly the economics? Those are all mixed in in making a huge decision about authorizing some new drug or some new treatment. Mm -hmm. Their arguments are always, we are looking for what's in the best interest of the health of the population of the United States. And that changes as we... And we've had some criticism in the past of that because we don't, we don't see their point of view when we have patients that need something approved right? and then they don't approve it. Yeah, because we have a myopic vision. We're yeah. looking at the We're people we at, know who have the issue we know about. Or, or specifically hormones. Yeah. And, and then they get all the way to the end and then they go, oh, you can't have those because they cause facial hair. We can fix facial hair. Right. You know, so that's not like a life and death complication, but that's one of the reasons they've given us for us not not giving testosterone to women. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of our myopic view, but there's, it's a, they have a huge number of drugs that they take care of and that they watch. It's a very expensive process to take a drug to market. market. You can, first you have to be approved for a clinical trial. So you have to go through this huge process of, of science, giving them the science and actually doing, doing some trials, then you get accepted. Then you have to go through very expensive clinical trials with with whatever they, how many people they ask you to do this with, depending on the the disease you're treating. And then you know, then you have to go again in front of them to see if you can get it approved. These are all done by the drug companies. Well, the last several medical conferences that we have gone mm-hmm. to have all included seminars on peptides. Right. And they've identified over a thousand different peptides in the human body. They've only named about 50 of them because the rest mm-hmm. of them just have long numeric, alphanumeric codes. Right. But people are studying each of those peptides to say, what exactly does it do? Mm-hmm. And can we then produce it uh, artificially mm-hmm. or outside the human body, not artificially? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they submit that to the government and say, hey, we, we've, we think this peptide works on this issue and we want to make it. Can you give us permission? So, for example, peptide is is a uh, a short a piece of a protein. So it's a group of amino acids that communicate in your body that you don't probably don't even think about and you don't know you have. There's thousands of them, three thousand they found, and they're all racing around your body like taxis in New York right. City. And they're not hormones. They don't race around in your bloodstream. They they go from t- tissue to tissue sometimes. Yeah. So. They are trying to figure out how we can take them, because right. right now it's usually by shots. They're trying to develop different methods to take them so that we can fix certain abnormalities or uh, metabolic disorders that we have. As we age, it gets worse. We lose these peptides, and we need to have them uh, replaced. So oftentimes, these peptides are necessary. So these are things that have, some of them have become drugs, like uh, Liguride is called Victoza. It's a drug to treat diabetes. It, it has become a drug approved by the FDA in a pen, and you give yourself a shot every morning. So basically, that is a drug to treat diabetes, to help diabetics lose weight and help their blood sugar. So it's it's a and it's also a weight loss drug. So that's a peptide, for example. 
but that got approved. But there's all these other thousands of peptides that haven't gotten approved, and some stimulate your uh, immune system. They stimulate your thymus, which is right here behind your breastbone, and to make all kinds of T cells so you can fight infection. So, and that's very important for people who have cancer or who have had cancer when they've had chemo and they can't get their immune system back up. Yeah. Things like that are things that will be looked at in the near future. And right now we have compounding pharmacies making them for people that that doesn't have to be approved by the FDA. Not now. Not currently, but it will probably come up. Yeah. So we have had our issues about the FDA and part, part of the discussion has been what you were just saying about the incredible investment in time and, and uh, cost. Millions and millions and millions of dollars to bring one drug to To research to a drug and, and try to bring it to the market and, and do the tests, set up the studies, and then submit those studies to the FDA for uh, analysis approval. and approval. There is a, a, a process that the FDA uses called fast tracking. Mm -hmm. And a company that has a proposal for a drug can take it to the FDA and they can ask for it to be fast tracked. And if it is fast tracked, then they shorten the time from anywhere from six months to years required for approval to mm -hmm. get the drug on the market and out there where people can it make use of it. It takes years and years so that they bring it down to, they could, could bring it down to six months for the specific reason of it's, it's a drug that we don't have another drug uh, to provide the the activity or the treatment that this is offering. Yes. So we have no other drug, or we have drugs that have such high side effects that for a particular disease, but this doesn't have those side effects. And then they also approve drugs for uh, quality of life, mm -hmm. like Viagra, and uh, in a fast track, which they did fast track. That's quality of life for guys. So, or women, I guess us too. So, um, th those are the three well, we reasons. Hope so. Yeah, <laughs> those are the, well, those are the a, three if, reasons. The the whole idea is to try to get drugs that are needed to the market mm -hmm. faster. Right. If there's an identified patient population, mm -hmm. we have this issue that there's no treatment for, mm -hmm. or there are treatments for, but they have really negative side effects, mm -hmm. like some of the cancer drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can come up with a new drug that alleviates the side effects. Mm -hmm then they're very interested in that. They would fast track it. If you can come up with a new drug that they don't currently have that mm -hmm. treats a particular type of cancer, say, mm -hmm. then they'll fast track that. You have to propose it to them. Would, hey, could you fast mm -hmm. track this? For this reason. Yeah, for this reason. So they want, uh, th these are the categories uh, of things they're looking for to consider fast tracking a drug. One is, does it have superior effect effectiveness? Mm -hmm. This works better than anything else that's out there. Mm -hmm. Like Victoza as a diet medicine yeah. compared to the historic diet pills, diet pills. that you would mm -hmm. take. So that works better. There's mm -hmm. a lot of data to support that. Mm -hmm. Avoiding serious side effects or existing ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, if nausea is a side effect for a lot of drugs, mm -hmm. if you can come up with a drug that treats a condition that doesn't cause nausea, mm -hmm. then Perfect. they're interested in fast-tracking that. Improving the diagnosis of serious conditions where early diagnosis results in improved outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, with like cancer is one of the easier ones to talk about because everybody understands how important that is. What they say about cancer all the time is early diagnosis mm -hmm. saves lives. So, if you can come up with a test or a medicine that the FDA can approve mm -hmm. that will lead to earlier and earlier diagnosis, mm -hmm. and therefore help fight and and defeat those illnesses so that people live. They can be treated early. Yeah, you have to be treated early. Mm -hmm. uh, decreasing the clinical significance, uh, toxicity of available therapies. Uh, so if, if you have to take this pill, but it makes you really sick, you have to mm -hmm. take this shot, but it makes you really sick so, because the long-term goal is to make the disease sick so it'll die. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you're going to be in bad shape. Right. And then, and that's a big one because most of the cancer treatments right. are awful. Yeah. And are I had a good rather, friend that died from a heart attack right after he finished his cancer treatment. He went and they said, well, you're cured of the cancer. You beat cancer. Two weeks later, he had a heart attack and died. And they and said it was from the strenuous response of his body to the treatment that he'd received. Right. He was he was overly stressed. Yeah. So the, and there's a, there are a lot of big side effects to cancer drugs that if we could find cancer drugs that actually work and actually don't have those side effects, that's what the FDA is approving as fast track or getting them through faster. Now, I want to interject right yeah. in the middle of your list. Sure. That well, in, the the in list, Europe, then. they 
don't have this method of 10 years down the line, we get a, we get a drug out. They, have, they go through initial testing. If it works, they then offer it to the public. So then if the drug doesn't do what it was supposed to or the drug has too many side effects or has problems, then they can pull it or they can change it to a different type of, a t different people that should get it or a different indication. So they do a different method and that's what the FDA is turning to right now for these specific drugs. The new news is the FDA has, ha is now fast tracking more drugs this year than ever before. And they're doing more of the short-term work, uh, short-term validation. And after that, then if there's problems, then they deal with that. Absolutely. This year alone, 43 new drugs were approved, which is 73% of all the drugs approved in 2018. Oh, well, that's, that's so great. That, that's amazing. There more and more of these drugs that are getting approved are getting approved because they're fast-tracked. Well, I've For exactly always wondered, the reasons that you, you suggested. I've always wondered why when they spend so much time bringing a drug to market and then they have to pull it for a reason, and they do that all the time. You hear it on the on television and the radio. Oh, this drug's off the market for this for this reason. Right. Well, they already had 10 years of study, and then all of a sudden it's out in the public, and then they have to pull it. So what's the difference between offering it to people who need it so, so 10 years ago, and then pulling it? According to Wall Street Journal, 10 years ago, only 10 drugs were approved using the fast track method mm -hmm. 10 years ago. In the last five years, 60% of all the new drugs have come through the fast track method. Which is so they're, they're, great. They're less of a slow moving monolith than they used to be. Right. But I and also think they're looking at Europe. Europe has used, most of the drugs we see on the market have been in Europe for years. Like my, my, cause I was a gynecologist or I am a gynecologist, the, uh, the Morena IUD was in Europe 10 years before it even got here. And it was a really, it's a really good IUD that has a little progesterone um, kind of a, a package on it so that people don't bleed. So the biggest issue with IUDs is people bled more, so they didn't like them. Yeah. Well, now with the Morena, they don't bleed very much. In fact, they may not even have periods on it. So it treats problems like people who have high, lots of bleeding as well as birth control. Well, and the companies still continue, and universities, to do research on things. I read an article just this week about a monthly birth control pill mm -hmm. that they have done research on, and they're trying to push it to the FDA to get approval to say, hey, can we put this on the market I'd and sell to it to see people? It before I well, I know. I mean, I, we, I haven't heard anything about it except that there there is one. Because you know that there's Depo-Provera, which did not turn out to be very good. Depo-Provera is I, a, I did not know that, is a I'll, shot that... Yeah. Goes is for three months. It's it's Provera. Provera is an um, a progestin, not progesterone, but it caused hot. It caused eight pounds of weight gain immediately, and then it caused wow. uh, high cholesterol, high cholesterol, and it caused fatigue. And I mean, yeah, it was birth control, but and it shut down your sex drive. So, <laughs> I mean, why bother? Just I mean, yeah, if you that, lose your sex drive, yeah, is, you just you know, kind of abstain or. Well, but you said that that's true. Uh, so remember. I think those are bad side effects, but about that was birth approved control for years. That, and testosterone. What, right. what, were you, what were you telling me about that? So we were talking about how um, all of a sudden the um, endocrinology, the group of people who run endocrinology, it's the American College of Endocrinology, have um, all of a sudden decided that testosterone is good for women. And they put it in their guidelines in October when in May they were castigating anyone who used testosterone on women and how terrible it was. They just turned, you know, they just turned and did the opposite and then said, oh, yeah, women need it for hypoactive sexual desire, which we've been doing this for 18 years. I mean, we've been giving people this for 18 years. And for me, before pellets, I was giving it to them for hypoactive sexual desire for years, for decades before that. So they finally figured it out. So now they are talking about giving it to people before menopause. They don't want to, but before menopause, women need testosterone because when they take the birth control pill, they lose their sex drive. Not everybody, but a majority of people, when we put them on the pill, they come in and go, yeah, we don't have sex anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> I so, don't really feel like it. So it's a uh, it keeps two, you from getting two pregnant. Dilemma. You, You're yeah. not getting pregnant. You're not having sex. And and I so guess that's supposed it works, to be okay. But it makes it more effective because you don't have sex well, at all. Well, that, that, as a continuation of this discussion about the FDA, that, that leads to uh, th this example. C 
culturally, an argument is made in well plus good website, which is a, the uh, most significant healthcare health website mm -hmm. in 2017. Mm -hmm. And we read an article on that website about uh, the social value of a good sex life for men compared to the social value of a good sex life for women. Right, like we don't count. And, and the arg <laughs> argument that was made in on this website and in, in their article was that societally, we accept the idea that men need to have a good sex life. And if men aren't having a happy sex life, there are all kinds of complications that are detrimental to society. Mm -hmm. And so they fast-tracked an approval of a drug for men uh, to improve their erections, Viagra. Viagra. And yeah. it was approved within six, six months. Six months. <laughs> and, and that's not life. That doesn't, like, change your life. It just makes your life better. And then they also said, because it's a political social agenda, that insurance companies pay for Viagra for men. Now they do. They, they didn't think, at first. They didn't at first, but now there's a generic. But now they understand they that, you know, happy, healthy men need a good sex life, and that, that's cheaper on our society. Right. But nobody says that about women. Nope. So women come along and say, well, we have women that don't have a sex drive. Mm -hmm. And we have some understandings about why they don't. It, it's mm -hmm. biochemical. It's psychological. We know it's more about hormonal. it than we used to. It's hormonal. And let's get a drug for that. Well, it took the women six years to get a drug approved as a libido-enhancing drug for women. And so there are two and drugs out there that help. Each of them are said to help about 20% of the female Only population 20 with the issue. Only 20% effective, and they have the side effect of nausea, and they, they're they really expensive. Yes. When And insurance doesn't pay for them. When testosterone is much less expensive than that, and works and you just you take well, it for it all kinds of reasons but it works it would work for 90 percent of the people not 20 right and it doesn't have the same side effects doesn't make you nauseated but you can't sell testosterone for three thousand dollars a month like you can right. some of these other and drugs. that's the whole point you, it would be you couldn't jack the price up i mean they do for men the, the price of the testosterone patch is outrageous yeah so they do jack it up, but it's, it would be, you know, they just, I think it's more social. I mean, I think it's that women don't want to say, oh, I'm on testosterone because that's a man's hormone. Right. Well, we've been lied to. <laughs> it's not a man's hormone. It's both of our hormones. It's men and women. And we have three times as much testosterone in our bodies when we're young and not on the pill as we do estradiol. So if you think of it that way, both men and women need testosterone, and it always starts going down and just stops being produced by the ovary at menopause. So, and, and so many of the women who lose their testosterone lose their sex drive. And lose a lot of other things. And lose a lot of other things. But if they get their testosterone back, it is a libido enhancer for them, a restorer for them. I, I mean, that's the first thing people come back. I put them on the... On, on the um, pellets and they come back four months later and they're like, oh my gosh, my husband's happy. We're having sex all the time. It's great. It's just like it used to be. Basically, that's that's the, uh, the oh my God, when they come back because it's not like, oh, I've lost 20 pounds or oh, I've, but they do, but oh, I've gained muscle mass or I'm stronger or I think better. That's the first thing they tell me. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm having sex all the time. Because you, you have all this information and you put it out there and I tend to personalize it. And I, <laughs> I remember having, as clients in my clinical practice, a, a couple, one of the issues in their marriage is that she didn't have any sex drive. She was trying to be responsive, but was not responsive. If you're not hungry, you're not hungry. And... <laughs> One of the suggestions was have your have your hormones checked, and mm -hmm. you saw this individual, and you put her on testosterone. And three days after you put pellets in her, she called me in a panic, and she said, "I'm having these feelings that I haven't had for years, and I'm worried about whether or not the mailman is safe to come <laughs> to my house." And and so I had to explain to her that's a a, a temporary surge; mm -hmm. it will diminish. The mailman is safe. You're not going to lose control of your own processes, <laughs> but you will feel desire mm -hmm. now. Like you used to. And that may be a, a beneficial effect in your marital relationships, mm -hmm. which it turned out to be. They were very happy about that. But but that's a specific example that always comes to mind yeah. when you start to give that information. So, so testosterone replacement was a place that we would suggest women go first. Right. 
And, and our hope is that the, the FDA will start to approve that for women mm -hmm. so that the insurance companies will start to pay for mm -hmm. it for women. And, and it's in the hopper. It's being discussed, but so far nothing's happened. But we're very encouraged that the fast tech pr track process is happening for more and more of mm -hmm. the medicines that are coming online. So contact your congressman. Tell them to contact the FDA. Get this approved for women. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.